Hello, and welcome to the lecture on chapter four. Here in this lecture, we're going to cover gravity. That's really the main topic. Now we're gonna talk about applications or realizations of gravity, which are projectiles and satellites. Projectiles like launching something like a cannonball, a satellite like a communication satellite going around Earth. Now let's consider what got us here. This is our fourth chapter. In the previous three have all been about very fundamental physical concepts. We explained motion, we explained forces, and the two physical quantities that are conserved, momentum and energy. Okay, so we've talked about motion, that was velocity and acceleration. We've talked about forces, which is which are pushes and pulls. And then we've talked about the two conserved quantities, momentum and energy. Okay, and really momentum and energy matter because they're conserved. They're great and interesting in their own right, but they're really useful to problem solving because they're conserved. Okay, and the, and the forces is, are what's what's you know what's happening. Why are things moving? Right, it's the why of movement. The motion is the how, but the, the forces are the why. However, there's an even another there's another bigger question: Why? Where do forces come from in the first place? Why do we even have forces? Well, there are four fundamental forces in the universe, and that is the one of the most building block ideas that you can possibly come up with. You can break the entire universe down to four fundamental forces. And the first one we're gonna talk about in this physical science class is gravity. Because it makes sense historically, it was the most prevalent force that people noticed in the in the ancient world, or even in the the 1500s when Newton was coming up with you know the theory of gravity and, and the theories of motion. And it's just a natural starting point because the other forces we're gonna talk about get into more complex ideas. Those other forces are very important. And when we move on to talk about chemistry, gravity is not even going to matter. Gravity doesn't matter for chemistry. For chemistry, you care entirely about electrostatic forces. Okay, And the forces aren't even very prevalent in the, in the expressions of chemistry. But certainly when we get into electricity and magnetism, and then even later when we get into the nucleus of an atom, we will briefly discuss other forces. But gravity is right there in terms of the force that makes satellites work. It's the force that makes roller coasters work. So let's get into it. Okay, so we're going to talk about the universal law of gravity, which is a great starting point historically. That's where the, the theory first came from. We'll talk about something called the inverse square law, which is the type of law that the universal law of gravity is. Okay, so an inverse square law is a broad category. Gravity is an example of an inverse square law. Okay, now the reason we, we would mention this is because there's other important laws that will be covered later in the course that are also inverse square laws. Okay. We'll talk about weight and weightlessness, okay? We've, we've talked about how weight is a force, but now we're going to come back to that. We'll talk about universal gravitation, so there's kind of the, the broadest idea. Then we'll get into those applications of gravity, projectile motions, launching things, right? So like in a game like Angry Birds, and you launch the bird, that bird is a project, projectile, all right? When you launch a cannon out of a cannon, or a cannonball out of a cannon, that's a projectile, okay? Then we'll talk about fast-moving projectiles, which turns out that's what satellites are. That's all a satellite is. The International Space Station is an artificial satellite, a man-made satellite. It's just a really fast projectile. What do I mean by that? Well, let's wait and find out. Okay, then we'll talk about the best simplified mathematical way to talk about satellites, which is circular satellite orbits. But then we'll talk about the more realistic case of elliptical orbits and the things that we can quantify and in, in this class and measure. And then finally, an interesting idea, escape speed. This is how much energy or initial velocity you need to escape the gravitational pull of a world, such as the escape speed to escape Earth. So if we want to spend, send a space probe out into deep space, past past Earth's orbit, out, you know, maybe past the gas giants like Jupiter and, and so on, and maybe even leave the solar system, then we have to achieve the, the escape speed. All right, so let's get into the legend of the falling apple, all right? So th this is like the legend of the uh, the drop off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Never happened, but it's a great story to illustrate the ideas that were thought of at this time. In this case, in Newton's time, and incidentally, Newton was one generation after Galileo. So a couple of big names we've talked about historically, okay? So Newton, famous scientist, philosopher, was not the first to discover gravity, right? People have noticed gravity ever since, you know, humans first were able to communicate with each other. Newton discovered that gravity is universal. That's the special part. Okay, gravity wasn't just something specific to Earth. It wasn't created by the gods. It was something that explained lots of phenomena, including Earth's rotation around the sun. Okay, the legend is that Newton was sitting under an apple tree and realized that the force between Earth and the apple is the same as, be as that between moons and planets and everything else. 
Okay. Now, what he did write about is he, he, you know, he wrote about how there must be one, you know, the force to drop something on Earth must be the same force that holds the moon around Earth. And indeed, that's the case. In fact, we can think of the moon as falling around Earth. Okay. Just like the apple is falling towards Earth. So in ancient times, Aristotle and others believed the stars, planets, and the moon moved in divine circles. Okay. So, and they weren't far off. A lot of orbits are close to circles, but there's nothing divine about them. And, mo and most of them aren't perfect circles. Okay. And, you know, it depends how accurately you want to measure it, right? Whether you call it a perfect circle or not. But some orbits, even in our own, own solar system, aren't circles at all. They're really stretched out, the elongated. That's called an ellipse. We'll talk about that more. Okay. And it was thought that those perfect circles were free from forces of Earth. They were just on their own, all right? On the, these almost like divine tracks, like gears in the, in the heavens. Okay. However, we now know that the moon falls around Earth in the sense that it falls beneath the straight line it would follow if no force acted on it. So imagine if the moon was just shooting past us. It was just a very fast object just flying through our solar system. Okay? Well, when, when it came past us with a certain velocity vector, it would then be pulled towards Earth with a force. Okay? that force would then cause an acceleration that is in the same direction as the force. We know that from Newton's second law. Look at chapter two, okay? So then there would be an acceleration in the same direction as the force. I'm putting little arrows on them to denote that these are vectors. They're, they're physical quantities that have direction, okay? So there's an acceleration pointing down towards the Earth, the same direction as the gravitational force. And that's because gravity pulls, okay? We'll talk about that gravity attracts, that's the right term, but here we can think of it as gravity pulling, okay? If that's the case, if there's an acceleration and a velocity, well, the downward acceleration in the picture, right, to the bottom of the page, and a velocity to the right of the page, then there, that would curve the path of this moon, right? It would curve the path just like it's showing, right? And then the moon would end up there, right? Because the acceleration would curve it downwards. And then its new velocity would point in this direction, wouldn't it? Okay, it would point downwards at an angle. So that's the idea. That's what's happening with the moon, is it's just falling. It's being pulled straight down to Earth, okay? But unlike my hypothetical example of saying that there's just some stray moon flying through the solar system, the moon has just the right velocity that as it gets pulled down, well, the ne its next location is going to allow it to get continue to get pulled down and then continue to get pulled down and it will follow a circular path. The length of its velocity vector, which is to say its speed, doesn't change, but it constantly is falling in an arc, an arc that exactly matches a circle, which is its orbit around Earth. That's what falling motion as an orbit is, and that's what the moon is doing, okay? The moon maintains a tangential velocity, that's its speed, and the length of the blue arrow, which ensures a nearly circular motion around and around Earth, rather than into it. If it was going slower, then it would fall into Earth. It would spiral into Earth, okay? If it was going really slow, it would just take one big arc and just crash right in, okay? If you, if you let the moon go from rest, it would fall straight down, right? Okay, but it's not. The moon is not at rest, and the moon is not going too slow. The moon is going just the right speed, because it is the leftover dynamics of a lot of things going just the right speed, okay? And there's some tidal forces that kind of maintain and have balanced out that speed, the same tidal forces that cause tides on Earth, okay? So this path is similar to the paths of planets around the sun. It's the same principle idea, okay? Now, it's similar in the sense that they're, they're, some, of our, some are more circular than others, but it's always the same idea. It's the same idea of universal gravitation, which is what we're going to be talking about, okay? So the universal law of gravity, let's start there. This is, the, this is the law that was proposed by Newton, okay? So Newton's law of universal gravitation states that every body in the universe attracts every other, other body with a mutually attracting force. So that means that any piece of mass with a value of m is attracted to any other piece of mass with a value of m, okay? And they could be the same mass, so M identical values, you know, one kilogram, one kilogram, for example. And then they're both going to experience a gravitational pull towards each other, okay? And by Newton's third law, those two forces represent a force pair, and so they always have to be equal and opposite. 
Okay, those two attractive forces have to be equal and opposite. We can already see they're opposite because they have to be attracted to each other so that it just innately makes them point opposite directions. Okay, equal and opposite by the third law. And you know that I mean the Newton's third law. Okay, all right, so that's, that's the principle. All mass attracts all other mass which is kind of wild if you think about it. Because that means if I hold up a ball in one hand and I hold up another ball, like, you know, let's say like a baseball and a, and a racquetball, and I'm holding them in my left and right hand, then they, they should be gravitationally attracted to each other. Won't they want to pull towards each other? Well, yes, they will. But the pull, it turns out, is so tiny, so infinitesimally small that we don't notice it for small masses like a baseball or even a person or even a, you know, like a boat, even the gravitational force of attraction towards a mass that's, you know, thousands of tons is still tiny, still too small to measure. It's only when you have masses that are on the order of 10 to the, to the trillion, so 10 to the 12, or in the case of Earth, Earth has, Earth has a mass that's on the order of 10 to the 24 kilograms, which is a trillion, trillion kilograms. So when you have masses that are that large, then gravity becomes noticeable, okay? But you need a lot of mass to notice the force because otherwise the force is so small. And that's the, that's the, the amazing thing that Newton noticed is that when he ran the numbers, he came up with an explanation of this force, a force that could create things like an orbit of a moon, but then would be not noticeable between everyday masses on Earth. So it seems like the, the force is just sort of this mysterious aura that surrounds Earth. And if you're on Earth, there's just gravity. It, you get accelerated downwards. But we now know that it's actually from mutual attraction of all matter. Okay? All right. So let me read the second sentence before we move on. So for two bodies, this force is directly proportional. Okay? We talked a lot about proportionality, so please review that term. To the product of their masses, the two masses that are attracted to each other, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance separating them. So what that sentence is, is putting this equation into sentence form, because we see the direct proportionality to the product. That's the product right there, the product of the two masses, m1 and m2, okay? So they need not be, they need not be the same. m1 doesn't have to equal m2, okay? d is the distance between them and the fact that it's squared is why we say it's the square and the fact that it's in the denominator is why we say it's inverse okay and d is the distance between the masses like this okay now what's the big g value well the big g value is a constant of the universe it's one of the three fundamental concepts or con constants of the universe. I know I've talked about the four fundamental forces and the three the three fundamental constants. You might be like thinking like, well, really, are there just that many? Well, we're not sure. But there are three big constants in the universe, which is the speed of light, the gravitational constant, and something called Planck's constant. So these are really, again, big ideas, okay? But the gravitational constant is a value. We don't know why it exists in the universe exactly, but it's, it's considered a fitting value. It's the measured value of how strong gravity is. Now there's some theories about where that force, where that, where that value comes from, but we're not exactly sure, okay? So this is called the gravitational constant. Gravitational constant. Okay, and we'll talk about the value of that. But suffice to say for now, it's really small, which is why gravitational forces are really small unless you have a lot of mass. Okay, moving on. Newton discovered that gravity is universal. That's that all mass attracts all other mass. Okay, there's a gravitational pull between the moon and Earth. Okay, that means the, the moon pulls on Earth and Earth pulls on the moon. The, the moon is much less massive than the Earth, so effectively the, the moon actually orbits Earth. Okay, now in reality, it's not orbiting exactly Earth, it's orbiting a balance point between the two, which is called the center of mass, but that center of mass is actually within Earth relative to the moon, okay? But it's not exactly at the geometric center of Earth because, again, it's a balance point, okay? The planet Earth also orbits the sun. Again, in that case, the sun is so much more massive than Earth, that effectively, the center of that orbit is the center of the sun, but not quite. There's a little, you know, it's slightly off from the center of the sun, okay? That's, that's the idea of how gravity is universally applied. Every mass pulls on every other mass. So Newton's most celebrated synthesis is of earthly and heavenly laws, weight on earth and weightlessness in outer space, masses and distances, or the path, paths of tossed rocks and the paths of satellites. So what's his most celebrated synthesis, his best idea, most celebrated idea? It's that 
uniting of earthly and heavenly laws, saying that the same laws that apply to earth apply to the heavens. That's a big deal. We may take it for granted today, but that was a earth shattering idea back in the 1500s. Okay, so here it is. Here's again in equation form, the universal law of gravitation. All right, so the greater the values of M1 and M2, the greater the force. So if either of those values are, are large or if they're both large, then that's a, there's a much larger force, okay? Always a force of attraction, okay? The greater the distance of separation, the weaker the force. And in fact, it falls off with the square. So if I double the distance, then I've cut the force by, by a fourth. If I triple the distance, then I've cut the force by a ninth, right? Because I have to remember to square it and then divide by that square. So. That's the principle behind the inverse square law, at least mathematically. If you, double, if you double it, then you have to remember to, to divide by the doubled value. So the reason that the inverse square law is around for something like the force of gravity is because of this idea of intensity. So it relates the intensity of an effect, gravity being an effect, to the inverse square of the distance from the cause. So the intensity, in this case, the intensity of gravity, is proportional to, and here using the approximately equal sign, but meant, meant as proportional, red is proportional. So it's proportional to one over the distance squared, okay? That's, that's what we see in the equation. That's part of the equation for universal gravity, okay? But this idea on its own is called the inverse square law relationship, okay? So the greater the distance from Earth, the less the gravity force on the object, no matter how great the distance the gravity approaches, it never, it does approach, but it never reaches zero. Because as you, as you divide by a larger and larger value, you're then going to get a smaller and smaller intensity, but it will never actually get to zero. If we were to graph it, the intensity of gravity, all right, as a function of distance, we'd see that it falls off, right? It just gets, gets closer and closer to zero, but it never gets there. That's what a one over x function looks like, or in this case, a one over d squared function, okay? In a calculator, that'd be like y equals one over x squared, okay? because horizontal axis being the distance, vertical axis being the output, which in this case is the intensity of gravity, okay? So definitely interesting result there, that it falls off that way, that it never approaches zero. Why should we expect that? Why should the intensity behave like this? Because gravity is spreading out in all directions, which means that it's effectively spreading out on this imaginary sphere of influence, this sphere of effect. And as you go further and further from the source of gravity, that sphere has a surface area right? So that there's a surface area that's being affected by a certain gravitational intensity. Well, surface areas are proportional to the square of the radius. That's where it comes from. It comes from thinking about the effects of gravity as an imaginary sphere of effect. And then just remembering that the surface area sphere is proportional to r squared, okay? In fact, it's 4 pi r squared is the value for the surface area, but the proportionality is r squared, okay? Right? So here's, here's like a little slice of that imaginary sphere. See, spreading out in, in distance. And you have that, you see how this is just like a little piece of a sphere. You can imagine the whole giant sphere going around, okay? All right, so the idea then is that as you go further in distance, you get a thinner effect. And I say thinner to relate it to the analogy in, on this page, on the slide, which is spray paint. Because if I, if I spray spray paint very close up, I get a very thick coat. As I move further back, that coat becomes thinner, and it becomes thinner with the square of how much further back I've gone, because that spray paint is spreading out in a spherical sense. You know, maybe it's just one wedge of a sphere, but it's still spreading out in a spherical sense, okay, over the surface area of a sphere. So if the distance is one unit, like one meter, whatever you want to think of the distance as, one foot, right, then the layer has a thickness of one. I'm not giving it a particular value, but saying that it has a baseline thickness of one layer. As we double the distance to two units, now the thickness is one quarter. When we triple the distance, the thickness becomes, well, look how much area it is. Now that paint has to cover more area. Instead of having to cover one square, which was at one unit of distance, or four squares when it was at two units of distance, now it's covering nine squares, which means it's one ninth as thick because the paint has to spread out over that greater area. When we get out here, we have 16. So 16 times the area, which means it's 1 16th as thick, because of course 16 is four squared, okay? Here's that graph we spoke about that falls off, approaches zero, but never gets there. And the, fun the functional form of that graph is one over d squared, okay? So we see that the gravitational pull of Earth decreases as we move away from Earth, okay? And it definitely falls off pretty significantly, right? If we're right at Earth, 
Then there's a certain strength of gravity, which we would be, which would be based on the distance from the center of Earth, its radius. Okay, and then you could calculate the strength of gravity using the equation. And when you calculate that strength of gravity, then you would get your value of acceleration, because then you would relate that strength of gravity to Newton's second law, solve for acceleration, and find that g at the surface. All right, if this if this was related to acceleration, g at the surface would be related to 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? But as you move up away from the planet, that value doesn't remain constant. There, you, would, you would accelerate towards the surface of Earth if you were just dropped from you know, some height one Earth, one Earth radius away, because it's essentially what this looks like here. But then you wouldn't fall as fast. You'd still fall towards Earth, but not as fast. And in fact, here, you would effectively weigh one quarter as much, see? Which means you would accelerate down one quarter as fast. You still would, not as fast. Instead of 9.8, it'd be about 2.5 meters per second squared. Okay? But as you got closer and closer, that value would gradually creep and creep up. Okay? All right. You probably wouldn't want to jump from a height of one Earth radius above the Earth. That is, after all, 6,000 kilometers. Okay? So let's do a check. The force of gravity between two planets depends on their masses and distance apart, planetary atmospheres, rotational motions, or all of the above. Well, you probably know this one. Just masses and distance. That's all you need to know, right? It takes you right back to the law of universal gravitation, okay? So the masses of two planets are each somehow doubled through magic, I suppose. The forces of gravity between them would what? So we have both masses doubling. So the masses of two planets are each somehow doubled. What would the new force of gravity be? Think about the equation. The equation says it's g m1 m2 over d squared. In this case, we're changing both m1 and m2, okay? It would quadruple because we'd have two times two, which means we end up with a four in the numerator, okay? Now, if the mass of one planet is somehow doubled, the force of gravity between it and its neighboring planet would what? So we still have the two planets, but we're only doubling the mass of one of them. Well, you probably know, in this case, it would just double because in this case, only one of the values of m is being doubled, say m1, okay? So now onto the actual value of the gravitational constant, which then can allow us to actually come up with values of force or say solving for the gravitational acceleration, which we've just taken as a given of, of 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? Now that's not the given, right? That, that's a determined value, okay? At, or that's based on theory, the, the, the gravitational acceleration that is, that's based on theory. The fundamental theory is this one right here, big G, gravitational constant. It is a proportionality constant. That's why I call it a fitting constant. We, again, we don't know exactly where it comes from. There are some theories, but we know it works and we know we can measure it, okay? And it has the same magnitude as the gravitational force between two one kilogram masses that are one meter apart. And the value is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, okay? And then if, if that's measured in Newtons, that would be the, val the value of force between those two one kilogram masses that are one meter apart. And first of all, notice this is a tiny force, right? 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons, that's a tiny, tiny force. That's why we don't notice the gravitational pull between everyday masses, okay? So then if we solve for the actual value of the constant, we see that the constant has units, which are, at first pass, I look very unusual, very strange. They're newton times square meters divided by square kilograms. So that, that's the units that work out to make sure that when you write the universal force law, m1, m2 over d squared, that both sides of the equation have the same units, units with it, which they much, must of newtons, okay? So when we write that equation out, we got an equation of force equals force, and that's made possible by the value and the units of the gravitational constant, okay? An experimentally determined proportionality constant. Wonderful, okay. So the universal gravitational constant, g, which links force to mass and distance, is similar to the familiar constant pi, little g, which is gravitational acceleration, acceleration due to gravity, or the speed of uniform motion. So what is it most similar to? What am I getting at with this check? It's pi. Because pi is the proportionality constant. Pi is the proportionality between the circumference and the radius. Aha, right? Or the circumference and the, di the diameter, right? That's what the, the ratio of c over d, circumference over diameter, is pi which is 3.14, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a number that never ends. Same thing here. We have a fitting constant that can be refined more and more with better experiments, but we don't know if it, if it has an exact value if, if, or if it's a number that never ends. 
Okay. All right. So now on to weight and weightlessness. We talked a bit about weight before, but now we're going to get into it again and talk about what it means to be weightless. Okay. So weight is a force. All right. It's the force exerted against a supporting floor or weighing scale. All right. So it's actually the name for the support force that is that results when you're standing on something stable due to the gravitational pull on you. Right. So if I was a draw person, I would draw a force down, I would call that the gravitational force. Then I would draw a force up, which we call the support force, or we could just call the weight. Okay? Weightlessness is a condition where there is no support force. So now you're on the floor, but you're just kind of floating above it. Maybe you're touching it, but you're not actually pushing into it at all. That's weightlessness. Because now we're saying that there is no push into the floor, so there's no push back. Because Newton's third law says that there's got to be an action to have a reaction. And if you don't push into the floor, the floor doesn't just push back on its own. Okay? So when will weightlessness occur? Well, weightlessness would occur if there's absolutely no gravity around. So if you're just so far from any, any other mass that there's just truly no measurable, measurable amount of gravity around. Or if the floor is moving with you. So Because imagine if you're falling at a certain velocity and the floor is also falling at that same velocity, then you'd be weightless. Uh -huh. Like in a free-falling elevator, you'd be weightless, okay? So here's an example of that. Here's the person in a free-falling car. They're weightless, okay? There's no support force. Now an astronaut is weightless for that same reason, because he or she is not supported by anything. They're falling, all right? They're falling with the space station around them or with the space shuttle around them. You know, that's it. They're just in free fall, okay? So it's a sensation of weightlessness that just comes from continual free fall. And again, the only reason that an astronaut in a satellite never hits the Earth is because they're moving so fast to the side, just like the moon, that they their arced path never hits the ground. But we'll come back to that, okay? All right, here's some other examples of relative weight due to the motion of the room around you, which we could think of as an elevator, right? So here's like the, you know, the cable holding the elevator. So if you're in an elevator at rest, well, that's a normal weight because there's just gravitational pull and the floor supporting you, okay? But if the elevator is moving up, then you'd actually, the scale would weigh, mo would weigh more than norm normal. It would read a weight more than normal. Because now you're being pulled into the scale, and then the elevator is accelerating up. That increases your weight. In this case, your weight would be g plus the upward acceleration of the elevator times whatever your mass is. On the other hand, if you're accelerating downwards, then you weigh less because now your weight is g minus a times whatever your mass is. And if now, if you accelerate down really fast so that your downward acceleration is g, which would be free fall of the elevator, not a great condition for an elevator, now you would have zero weight because your weight would be equal to g minus g times m. But of course, g minus g is just zero. But that only happens if the room or the elevator is accelerating down at gravitational acceleration. All right, so when an elevator accelerates upwards, your rate reading on a scale is, right? Don't look back at the picture. Make sure you can reason it out, okay? And these are good ones to come back to. I would always ask yourself, make sure you can remember which, which case you're heavier, which case you're lighter, and why, okay? So of course, in this case, if the elevator is accelerating upward, your weight is greater, okay? When an elevator ac accelerates downwards, your, rate, your weight is less. When the elevator cable breaks, the elevator falls freely. So now your rate reading is, you got it, zero, okay? You're weightless. So if you weigh yourself in an elevator, you'll, may, you'll weigh more when the elevator is what? So let's just phrase a different way to make sure that you can think about it, right? Make sure you can answer this one. Accelerates upwards. Notice that moves upwards is not enough. Neither is moves downwards for that matter because moves could imply constant velocity and constant velocity doesn't affect your weight. Only acceleration does, okay? Now, projectiles. Why are we moving on projectiles? Well, because projectiles have weight, so it's a natural transition, right? And projectiles are gonna take us to satellites, okay? Projectiles are basically a perfect example of gravity because the only force acting on them, if we ignore air resistance, is gravity, okay? So what is a projectile? It's any object that moves through the air or through space under the influence of gravity, all right? And in an ideal projectile, gravity is it. Right, you can ignore, ignore air resistance. So the curved path of a projectile is a parabola. All right, it's parabolic motion. Example, a stone thrown horizontally 
curves downward due to gravity, right? So if I throw something off like the edge of a cliff, I give it some initial velocity. There's my something I'm throwing, of some stone. It's gonna take that curved path and it'll look like one half a parabola. If I launch something from the ground, I can, I can have it look like a full parabola, okay? If I launch it in an angle relative to the ground. Right, here's an example of that one half of a parabola by launching something horizontally off the edge of a cliff. All right, so projectiles curve as a result of these components, the constant motion horizontally and the accelerated motion vertically. Why is it constant horizontally? Because there's no forces in the horizontal direction. Why is it accelerated motion vertically? Because there is a force in the vertical direction, it's gravity, okay? And it's pulling you downwards, okay? And gravity over small di differences of distance here isn't gonna vary. Because you might say, oh, well, gravity is proportional to distance squared. Yeah, but only if the distances are great. The height of a cliff, even if it's a two kilometer cliff, isn't gonna be a big enough difference to change the value of gravity. So you can use a constant value of acceleration for projectiles, okay? So projectile motion is a combination of two types of motion. And that's actually a wonderful thing, way to think about it. You can think about the motion in the horizontal direction is independent of the motion in the vertical direction. When you realize that, then you realize that the overall parabolic path is just a combination of just taking the one motion and in, you know, in the vertical and then considering the motion in the horizontal and then bringing them together, just like that, okay? So if you launch something at an angle, right? So I give something some initial velocity in an angle direction, then it takes a full parabolic path, especially over level ground like this, all right? And note that the vertical velocity component, that means the part of the vertical velocity, changes with time. The horizontal component remains constant. And by parts, I mean they're like sides of a triangle. Right, so here is the initial vertical component. I'll call that V, zero for initial, Y for vertical. And then this one here is the initial horizontal component, X for horizontal, okay? Well, that X component never changes. It's the same every time because there's no acceleration. There's no force in the horizontal direction. That Y component, however, gets smaller because there's a downward force slowing it down. It's momentarily at rest, so there is no vertical velocity at the top of the arc. And then it starts actually growing as it falls back down. All right, until it reaches the same length but opposite direction when it hits the ground if it's level ground, okay? So the velocity of a typical projectile can be represented by horizontal and vertical components. Assuming negligible air resistance, the horizontal component along the path of the projectile increases, decreases, remains the same, or do we need to know more? Well, which is it? It remains the same. No force in the horizontal direction, okay? Which means no acceleration, which means no change in velocity. So when no air resistance acts on a fast moving baseball, its acceleration is what? Downward G due to a combination of constant horizontal motion and accelerated downward motion, opposite to the force of gravity, or is it a centripetal acceleration? It's just downward G, that's it. So it's quite simple. There's just one acceleration, it points straight down, all right? So this can result in having the, the measurement or a prediction of how far things will go if you launch them at different angles. All right, so for equal launching speeds, the same range is obtained from two different projectile angles that add up to 90 degrees. This is a wonderful mathematical fact and just comes directly out of solving for the parabolic motion. It really just comes down to that, that algebraic math, okay? And so you can see that a 75 degree initial velocity, that'd be 75 degrees above the ground, so you, like you tilted up your launcher 75 degrees, is the same range or yields the same range right? That's until it hits the ground again. Call that the range, okay? Of a 15 degree launch. Now, of course, the 75 degree launch goes really high, right? And then comes back down. Whereas the 15 degree launch never goes really high, but they both result in the same range, okay? So a ball tossed at an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal will go as far down range as one toss at the same speed at an angle of, remember the rule, all right? 60 degrees, because 60 and 30 add up to 90 degrees, okay? So that's, that's, how, that's how you can always find the same angles that give the same range, or the two angles that give the same range. So one thing we will consider, we won't talk a lot about air resistance when it comes to projectiles, but since air resistance is prevalent for certain things, it's good to consider what the effect of air resistance is, at least in a qualitative sense. So if we do add in air resistance, if we consider a little bit, then we can say that both the range and the altitude are decreased. Because with air, air resistance, the projectile is slowing down the whole way, right? No matter which way it's moving, air resistance is always gonna slow it down. That's the way friction works. It just slows you down in whatever direction you're going, 
right? It always points opposite your direction. Unlike gravity, which always points in the same direction. Big difference there, okay? Without air resistance, the speed lost going up is the same as the speed gained while coming down. However, with air resistance, you lose speed both on the up and the down, all right? So now let's get to why satellites can be considered fast moving projectiles. And this actually is a good way to think about satellites. It yes, it's a little, little, you know, like elementary, right? But it's such it's such a great way to tackle what can be a really concept idea. You know, how do you balance something in set in a satellite motion? You know, why don't satellites fall out of the fall out of the heavens, right? You know, well, because they're just fast moving projectiles. Okay? So satellite is any projectile moving fast enough to fall continually around Earth. So to become an Earth satellite, the projectile's horizontal velocity must be so great that its trajectory matches Earth's curvature, right? Because we saw those curved paths, right? We saw that projectiles curve down. Well, if you have them have a very, very large horizontal velocity, they still curve down, but so does the ground below them. See? So this really large girl here throws a ball so fast, I mean, it's a small planet, that it curves down, but notice that the curve matches the curve of the planet underneath her feet. So then the ball just goes all the way around and comes back around and hits her in the back of the head, okay? Because she created a satellite, all right? Now, in practicality, you can't throw something fast enough to create a satellite. It has to be traveling at about 7,000 meters per second. And if you were to, to even, even if you could throw something at 7,000 meters per second, if you did it inside Earth's atmosphere, the air resistance would be so great that it would simply incinerate, okay? Unless it had incredibly good heat shields, right? And some way to get rid of all that heat energy, which is something that we have to consider when we bring satellites back in or a spaceship back into our atmosphere. But point being, you can't have an in-Earth or in-atmosphere satellite. That's why satellites are up above the atmosphere, where there's, there's so little air resistance, almost none, that they don't burn up, okay? So the curvature works out to be, so Earth's curvature drops a vertical distance of five meters for every 8,000 8, meters of tangent surface. So the orbit, so to orbit Earth, a projectile must travel at 8,000 meters to fall, um, and the time it takes to fall five meters. And how, how long does it take to fall five meters? One second. We learned that in the first chapter on motion, okay? In chapter one, we learned that it takes one second to fall five meters, okay? So please review that chapter to remember that, that rule, okay? So, and that, that's with our particular Earth's gravity, but that's, you know, that's where we live, right? So that means that you have to be traveling at 8,000 meters per second. Now I said 7,000, because that's an approximation for once you're out of the atmosphere. But if you wanted to travel right at the surface of Earth, right? Totally, totally infeasible. You'd run in the mountains, right? Well, you'd have to be traveling 8,000 meters per second at sea level, okay? So as the ball leaves the girl's hand, because again, this, you know, throwing things very quickly, one second later, it will have fallen how far, right? Because notice no matter how fast she throws it, it still falls the same vertical direction. That's because the horizontal part of the motion and the vertical part are separate from each other. And we know the answer. It falls five meters below the dash line. It falls five meters. No matter how fast she throws it to the side, you know, she just drops it straight down. It always falls five meters in that first second of free fall, okay? In the absence of air resistance. So when you toss a projectile sideways, it curves as it falls. It will be an Earth satellite if the curve it makes matches the curved surface of Earth, results in a straight line, spirals out indefinitely, or none of the above. Well, I think you probably all know this one. Matches the curved surface of the Earth. That is the condition to make a satellite, okay? And that's what, that's what rockets do when they launch at the satellite. First, they launch kind of straight up to get up out of the atmosphere. Then they turn to the side, fire a second booster at an, at an angle that's kind of you know parallel to the surface, right? So they turn, they turn 90 degrees, and then they give that last boost to give enough velocity to the side that then creates that stable circular orbit, creates a projectile that curves as it falls downwards, but curves in such a way that it never hits the ground, okay? That's the idea. So imagine that you had an elevated bowling alley. What speed would allow the bowling, bowling ball to clear the gap? How fast would it be going right here? So that as it curves downwards, it matches the curve, curve of the earth. Well, it depends how high your elevated bowling alley is. But if we su assume that the elevation here is small, then we know it's about 8,000 meters per second, okay? Which is eight kilometers per second because every thousand meters is a kilometer. So that's what circular orbits are all about. And things that are in circular orbits are called satellites. Lots of man-made ones, artificial satellites, lots of natural satellites as well, or at least one for Earth, but other planets have lots of, lots of satellites. So 
A payload into orbit requires control over the direction of the rocket, because as I said, it has to go up first and then turn to the side to become the projectile. So initially the rocket is fired vertically, then it's tipped. Once above the atmosphere, the rocket is aimed horizontally. See, okay? Because otherwise, if you just fired the rocket straight up and then let it run out of fuel, it would just go straight up and then kind of curve back down and crash into Earth again, right? But if you have it go up, let it tip and then fire a second rocket, then you can give it that velocity that now it doesn't just fall right back down and crash into Earth, but it still falls, but it falls in such a way that it never crashes into Earth. But it's still free fall, which is pretty amazing. That's all satellites are, just very fast moving projectiles, okay? So the payload is given a final thrust, right, once above the atmosphere to orbital speed of eight kilometers per second, and now it falls around the Earth. Now this value, they keep using it, right? They, they being the authors of the book, right? Now, in reality, the lowest satellites are at about 300 kilometers above the surface, and that means that the velocity is only, only about 6,600 meters per second, so about 6.6 .6 kilometers per second. And as you go higher and higher up, the satellites that are, say, you know, 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, or even 6,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, those very high satellites, which are usually communication satellites, those ones can, are go even slower. Because for them, they don't have to go as fast because they're further away and gravity is weaker, and thus they don't have, you know, they, they, they don't accelerate down as quickly so they can get away with lower velocities. And indeed, they need lower velocities, otherwise they wouldn't have circular orbits, okay? But this, this value of 6.6 .6 kilometers per second, that's like the International Space Station. That's how fast it's moving, okay? So positioning beyond Earth's atmosphere where air resistance is almost totally absent. That, that's where you have to begin your, your circular orbit. So examples, the space shuttles are launched to an altitude of about 150 kilometers or more to be above the air drag. Because anything, anything below there, there's very little air drag. The atmosphere gets gradually thinner as you go up, but there's still enough that it would be significant. Okay, It would, it would, it would mess with the dynamics. You'd have to use a lot of extra fuel. So 150 kilometers is a good safe distance above Earth where there's almost no atmosphere left. All right. Are they above Earth's gravitational field? No way. In fact, gravitational acceleration at a altitude of 150 kilometers is pretty close to 9.8. Even when you get to 330 kilometers, like the International Space Station on average, the gravitational acceleration there is still in the, val is still in the range of 8 kilometers per second. All right. So it's gone down by a little, but not that much. Oh, excuse me. 8 meters per second squared. And that's, that would be the value of gravitational acceleration at that height. Okay, so when a satellite travels at constant speed, the shape of its path is, talked about this a lot, a circle, an ellipse, an oval that is almost elliptical, or a circle with a square corner, as seen throughout your book. Eh, what do you think? It's a circle, of course, okay? That's the idea. If the speed is constant, then this, the projectile becomes a circular orbiting satellite, okay? However, a lot of satellites have a value that doesn't result in a perfect circular orbit. And that can result from like when you're doing the positioning of the rocket and you get up to this stage right here where you're going to give it some initial boost or some really a final boost to get to give it just the right velocity. What if instead of giving it eight kilometers per second, you gave it say 15 kilometers per second of velocity at that point? Well, that'd be too fast. That means it would overshoot its mark. It would go way out here and then it would come back in closer. So what you'd end up with is an elliptical orbit by giving it too much initial velocity. You could also end up with an elliptical orbit by not giving it enough. And the too much or the enough would be relative to its height when that final boost is given, okay? But the point being is you, it's easy to end up with elliptical orbits. They happen naturally, and there are also lots of examples of man-made elliptical orbits. Sometimes they're desirable. So the oval path followed by a satellite is an ellipse. It's a closed path taken by a point that moves in such a way that the sum of its distances from two fixed points, which are called foci, is constant. Maybe you remember this from a geometry class, all right? So elliptical orbits have a speed that varies, whereas circular orbits had constant speed, important difference. So initially, if the speed is greater than needed, okay, as I was speaking about, for circular orbits, the satellite overshoots a circular path and moves away from Earth, okay? That'd be like coming up to here. All right. The satellite then loses speed and regains it as it falls back to Earth. It rejoins its original path with the same speed it had initially, that overshot speed, and then it's repeated. So it gets up here and it has a small speed when it's far away. And as it loops back around in its elliptical path, returning to its initial speed that allowed it to overshoot in the first place, it goes fast. All right. So it's slow when it's far away. It's fast when it's close. 
That's all about conservation of energy because we're exchanging potential energy for kinetic energy. Please review the last chapter and lecture to, to hear about potential energy and kinetic energy. So the speed of a satellite in an elliptical orbit varies, remains constant, acts at right angles to its motion, or all of the above. Which one is it? It's it varies, okay? That's what elliptical orbits are all about. Okay, so what about escape speed? I said this is gonna be the last topic of the lecture, so you, you better know we're almost done. Well, escape speed is what happens when you make the ellipse so stretched out. You make that initial velocity so big that your overshot is so extreme that it basically breaks the ellipse, right? Because you imagine you stretch out a, a, a circle into an ellipse, but you stretch it out so much it just becomes a flat line. Well, when it becomes that stretched out, then you, you've achieved the escape speed. You've, gone, you've given enough initial velocity through enough initial kinetic energy that that projectile isn't going to be a satellite. Instead, it's just going to go off into space indefinitely until some, something else with gravity pulls it in, of course. Okay? So the initial speed that an object must reach to escape gravitational influence of Earth is known as escape speed, at least Earth's escape speed. Right? If, if you're launching a satellite off on a different world, right, then you have a different escape speed. What about when you need to bring home a mission from Mars? Well, then you need the Martian escape speed. And it's, it's whatever is the mass and the radius of the planet will determine the escape speed of that planet. For Earth, it's 11.2 kilometers per second. Notice it's significantly faster than, than um, the velocities of satellites. That makes sense. It should be, okay? Almost twice as large. So the escape velocity is the escape speed when direction is involved. So if you, if you hear someone talk about escape velocity, escape speed, they're the same thing. The difference is velocity means direction. Speed is just a value, okay? So the first probe to escape the solar system, that would be have a solar escape speed, was the Pioneer 10, which was launched back in 1972, and it accomplished this by directing the probe into path, the path of oncoming Jupiter, which gave, some, gave it something called a gravitational slingshot, which, by the way, is all about conservation of momentum, okay? So when a projectile achieves escape speed from Earth, it forever leaves, leaves Earth's gravitational field, it outruns the influence of Earth's gravity but is never beyond it, or it comes to an eventual stop, eventually returning to Earth at some future time. Does it eventually like kind of you know, slow down and then fall back in? Or do all of those apply? Okay, what's B? And why do we know that B is the best answer? Because here the, the, these require careful reading. It's because it, it, goes, it never goes beyond it. And that, that right there should tell you that's the right answer. Because remember when we talked about the gra universal force law, and we talked about how that it falls off as, as a function, right? That, had that, that graph had a particular look, which was the one over D squared, the inverse square law relationship. Well, it never hit zero, did it? Which means Earth's gravity never truly goes away. But you can continue to outrun it forever. Okay, well, that was what, our, what I hope was an interesting lecture on gravity, projectiles, and satellites. Thank you so much for watching.